The majority of the members of the crew belong to a union. We do not. It's just shocking that we do not have the same rights and privileges that they do. What matters is there's human beings working with no health care, no pension and welfare, no overtime, zero protections. We also don't have the protection of safety within our workplace. If something mm -hmm. goes wrong, we're not eligible to go to HR. We are completely mm -hmm. on our own. And the mm -hmm. only way that's going to change is through a union. We work crazy hours. There sure. are no boundaries that stop somebody from calling us on a Saturday and making us start a music search. Nothing that stops them from making us put in a 17 hour day if that's what it takes. I work an average of six, seven days a week. When we are licensing and clearing music, we are negotiating on their behalf and they expect mm -hmm. us to negotiate hard and they mm -hmm. expect us to negotiate with their best interests in mind. I'm gonna turn the tables and now I'm gonna do it for me. That's what 75% of the music supervisors are saying. What we do on your behalf, mm -hmm. we are now going to do for ourselves. We need this, so we're gonna fight for it. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book, third edition, coming very soon. Today, my guest is Madonna Wade Reed. If you know anything about sync licensing or the sync licensing space, then you've heard the name Madonna Wade Reed. She is a music supervisor superstar. She has been uh, doing in the music supervision space for about two decades, and her credits are endless, just to name a few of the shows and projects that she has been the music supervisor on, placed music on these shows, Smallville, Rain, American Crime, Batwoman, The Red Line, Heartbeat, Jane by Design, Charlie's Angels, Castle, on and on and on and on and on. She is, uh, we, we do talk about the role of what, what a music supervisor does. So if you're interested in music supervision or curious about what music supervisors do, yes, we, we definitely get into that. If you're interested in, in you know, how and where she decides to find music and what it takes to clear the music and for her to choose your song. We get into that as well, but we spend the majority of this conversation on the most pressing matter that is affecting music supervisors right now, and that is their working conditions. There is a massive movement right now that is swelling. It has been getting a lot of press, and it is the fact that music supervisors do not maintain the same benefits, pay equity. It is the fact that music supervisors these days, it is the fact that music supervisors these days do not enjoy the same benefits that all of their other colleagues do in terms of health benefits, in terms of uh, overtime payment or or just pay equity in general, uh, health care and retirement plans, um, the ability to to negotiate uh, with employers in good faith, have the seat at the table to do that, and because they're not in a union. Now, for those of you who are not very familiar with the film industry, virtually everyone else that works in the film industry is in a union. The actors and the producers and the directors and the techs on set and the editors and um, everyone else that you go on set, virtually everybody there is in a union and has benefits, um, is paid fairly, they get health insurance, all of that. Music supervisors do not. And so the music supervisors have come together and they said, you know what? Enough is enough. We would like to join a union. A union has welcomed them in, IATSE, the IATSE union, who represent a lot of the other uh, entertainment workers. And we get into what this effort has become and why there is so much resistance to allowing music supervisors into the union. This is a very revealing episode. Uh, there's a lot of call to actions. And so if you care about music supervisors in any capacity. If you want your music placed in film, TV shows, video games, commercials, all of that, I would encourage you to follow the steps that Madonna discusses um, towards the end on what you can do to support the movement. Now, we've put a lot of those links in the show notes, so you can check them out there. You can follow 
us all that make the show happen at Ari's Take on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. You can find me at Ari Herstan on Twitter and Instagram. Please give us a five star review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Uh, however, you're listening to this right now, we'd love that review. I love reading the reviews. Head over to YouTube, uh, leave us a comment there. If you're listening on YouTube, I love to read those comments. But uh, first, pause this and subscribe to the show. If you want us to show up in your feed, just uh, hit that subscribe or that follow button so you can hear more episodes uh, about the new music business. We do a lot. We cover a lot on sync licensing. We've had so many great, incredible music supervisors and sync agents and everything else. So if you are interested in in sync or anything else about the new music business, hit that subscribe button and head over to aristake.com and get on the email list. That is where you're going to get the most up-to-date, most relevant information about the new music business in your inbox. Hit aristake.com, sign up on that email list. All right, let's kick into the show. Madonna Wade Reed, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. For so having I have to I have to start off and, and say, for as long as I've known what uh, sync licensing and music supervisors were and sync licensing is, uh, I have known the name Madonna Wade Reed. Uh, there are <laughs> there are there are some superstars in this industry, and you are definitely one of those superstars. So I'm very excited to talk to you today. Uh, <laughs> shake your head. <laughs> very humble. No, I you know I've seen your name uh, in the credits at the end of more TV shows than I can count. Um, you know, and it's um, and over the last you know I I man you've changed. Uh, you you brought songs into the zeitgeist, into uh, pivotal moments and shows, and like you know, not least of which what you did with Smallville and Remy Zero, and took that song and and for ten years running, I mean that song like that changed the trajectory of that band and that song, and and you've changed a lot of lives and uh, with with musicians and artists and uh, not least of which my own because you set the. <laughs> You set the sonic palette of One Tree Hill, and when you passed off the show to Lindsay Wolfington, uh, she placed my song in that show, and that changed my entire life. And so, you know, music supervision oh. and and songs and and what the work that you do and and all music supervisors, it's just like it is um, something that is I think underappreciated. And something that has really changed so many people's lives and so many artists' lives. And in, in our community, I mean, you know, there it's pretty incredible um, how musicians talk about music supervisors and just like how you're like these these um, like godlike figures that we are all just kind of like like just in disbelief of how um, you work and operate and and just like the incredible work that you do. So. All that to start off as a big <laughs> thank you. Welcome to the show. <laughs> uh, nice to be here. You're welcome. Um, let me just say, you know, somebody has to be making great music for us to be great music supervisors, though there are occasions that um, people would like to overlook where our job is to actually place bad music. Mm. Mm. <laughs> we don't we don't like to talk about it, but sometimes yeah. it calls for bad music. Um, hey, yeah, and that's a really hard scene description to write on paperwork. <laughs> We're gonna need some bad music yeah. here, so uh, yeah. yeah can you, so uh... they're gonna say this is a really cheesy song and ask the other yeah. character if they like it. Um, no. Oh God! Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dude, I've been doing it for a long time, but I do it yeah. because I love it, and. Mm. Um, without knowing how to sing, dance, or write music or play an instrument. This is uh, the closest I could be to mm -hmm. music and musicians and, you know, do my little teeny tiny part in support of that career and that artistry. And at the same time, you know, do what I can to contribute to the development of my craft, Yeah, which has been really important to me over the years. Absolutely. and. You know, my audiences uh, and the listeners to this show, they're very familiar with sync licensing and music supervisors. We've had a bunch of music supervisors on the program, including uh, Lindsay Wolfington and Jen Malone and Brian Vickers and um, Chris Doritas and on and on and on. Um, but I want to kind of um, I, I want to ask you as someone who has seen the process evolve over the years, but also um You've been part of the process in many cases from the very, very early stages of development to the very end. And I would love to hear 
Uh, what is it like, and, and just kind of step us through the process when a new TV show is being developed and they bring you in as a music supervisor, just kind of the work that you do and what goes into it from we want you on this new new show, we don't know if it's going to get picked up yet, but we hope, to maybe the end of season one, kind of what that trajectory looks like. And um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a really interesting process because, first of all, everybody, when they talk about the craft of music supervision and how you apply it to projects and stuff, um, a lot of people sort of make it a one note talent, which is that you have to have good taste in music, <laughs> um, that that's how you do this job. Mm -hmm. What people don't see, and, and it's important that you're mentioning that we come onto the projects very early, is when I come onto a project and it's at the script stage or they're developing the script and they want to know what I think about certain storylines that may have a very strong music presence, mm -hmm. um, the way I help at that early stage, um, I credit with being an avid people watcher. What? Is, what how's that? My talent is that I'm a people watcher. I okay. grew up, my mom's favorite activity was to go to cafes and just sit and she go, let's just go people watch. Mm -hmm. And so coming into a project very early on sometimes is not about knowing exactly what the right music is, the first step is actually understanding whose story you're telling. And that comes mm. from people watching. Oh, wow. That comes from looking at a character, the nuances of how they speak, how they dress, all of these things don't have anything to do with whether I have good taste in music, they have to mm. do with, can I look at somebody and make an assessment about mm. who they are? I often, during the shooting, in the initial shooting stages, I will ask to be sent pictures of sets and environments. Oh, wow. Like when they go, there's a bar scene, I go, you got to send me a picture of the bar. Yeah. Are they Naga Hyde Bonquette booths? <laughs> Is there a ton of neon lighting? Sure. Is anybody wearing cowboy boots? Yeah not about in those moments it's not about whether i have good taste in music it's a matter right. of do i understand stories do i understand environments mm. and then do mm. i understand how to support them musically mm. then maybe you could say my choices are good good taste but <laughs> sure. that's where i start and so uh, that happens in the beginning mm -hmm. and then when they're shooting you know if i can help i will um hand over music for playback even if you don't hear it when you're shooting, it can set the mood, it can mm. get extras going. So I, mm -hmm. I lend my support during, you know, obviously the actual production stage. Oh, wow. Pre-production stage, let's talk about what we're looking for. Let's talk about each character. Let's talk about the overview of the entire project. Mm. Let's create a musical character. Let's not be schizophrenic about this unless mm -hmm. that's what it calls for. Mm -hmm. Support it during the production stage and then really put the pedal to the metal in post. Mm. You know, where I, that's when I start, you know, anything that is being added to a cut that wasn't necessary prior or the beginning or didn't require um, that a song be written or pre-recorded or a performance, then I do the heavy lifting at the end, which is as the cut is coming together, I am there to provide music for any scene that needs it. Mm. When you're working with uh, the director or the producer or the showrunner um, and you're kind of in that editing stage towards the end of, of uh, that editing process of an episode, let's say, and how do you, uh, I guess, who kind of designates where the, the, where the score is going to go versus where the music that you're going to place, uh, I guess what you call like the needle drop music, where that's going to go. And how, is, how are those uh, conversations and, and how does that all work? Um, I mean, we ha obviously we have a spotting session, but that's usually yeah. once a, a, we're, we're at Locked Picture. But in mm. the run up to Locked Picture, Mm -hmm. You know, if you're working with a good crew and you have a really good open dialogue, I always say filmmaking by community, we mm -hmm. talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I often, I listen, I believe that music supervisors, our wiring is a little different. When okay. we're reading a script, there's a little like flag that comes up in our head 
when our ear tells us we expect to hear something. Mm. So obvi there's obvious, you know, you're in a diner, you're at a party, you're in a car. There's always very obvious environments that you will hear music. Sure. What becomes a little more creative is when you, when there isn't a source for the music, but you're using it to enhance a scene. Mm. So those conversations are a lot of what takes place in post and if you're working with people who are open to having a good dialogue, you will have conversations about it. And, you know, anyone who hires me knows that if I think a scene that I'm watching is dry or maybe has a piece of score in it, but could benefit and be more successful with a song, oh, I'll mention it. <laughs> nice. I'll mention good. it and we'll, yeah. we'll have a discussion about it. Um, so I like to think that we all decide together Mm. in the lead up to the locked picture but then mm -hmm. there's always room for an additional discussion in the spotting session because at that point everyone who has a finger in the pot of you know what is happening orally in the project mm -hmm. is in the same room mm. and you can hear what others say mm -hmm. even if there's a dialogue between you know myself and the producer and the composer about who should cover this spot sometimes it's nice to have one of the sound mixers go you know what i think because you, you know we're deep in the forest sometimes sure um so in those moments you can you sort of come together as a community and you make these decisions you know in best in service of your viewers totally and wanting them to have the best experience and whatever you can do to enhance it with music and you make a decision together to do it. So then when you've made that decision and you know where the moments are that you're going to place music, uh, what's the next stage of the process to actually obtain that music and clear it and place it and and <laughs> massive head drop? <laughs> yeah, step me through that. <laughs> it's the part I hate the most. Okay. It's the And it's the part that nobody you know, likes to talk about, which is, mm -hmm. this is, you know, this is a, a part of the music business is the licensing aspect. And many supervisors um, are tasked with clearing the music, which is why you will meet a lot of supervisors who have law degrees. Mm -hmm. Wow. I have, I like to think I have an imaginary one because <laughs> I am forced to get in the trenches mm -hmm. with licensing departments, managers, mm -hmm. lawyers. I mean, I, have that language. I speak hmm. a second language, legalese. Sure. Um, and yes, I have to go out and find every single party who is involved in the song. And every single party has to sign off on the use. Um, my briefs uh, famously hold the line, if you don't know where the bodies are buried, do not send the song. <laughs> So, you know, does that does that mean uh, that I'm going to break that down? That means like if there's three co-writers on a song that you're submitting, if you can't track down one of the co-writers on this song, don't even bother sending me the song because that's going to be a clearing nightmare. Is that kind of one of those bodies that yes, we're talking about? Okay. That's very mean. <laughs> yeah. Or or you used a sample and you chose not to tell anyone. Ah. That's an issue. Yes. You know, people, yes. I, listen, having your song placed in media is very exciting and mm -hmm. it can have a ripple effect to raise someone's success. It is a, it is a stream to make money. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good things that come from a placement. And when someone is in the excitement of that possibility, they forget stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like telling you there's a sample in the song or you know, that actually the producer whose studio they recorded it in, that guy owns the master. <laughs> you oh, know? Wow. Like yeah. they just forget to tell you stuff. And yep. while it can all that, it, you know, that sweater can be unraveled and we can re-knit it and figure it out. Sometimes the timetable, especially in television, is a very short window to turn things around. <clears throat> so it can be super problematic. Mm. to be tasked with clearing music and not everybody is prepared to do their part. Sure, sure. Which is why that I makes, don't enjoy it. Yeah, no, and that makes sense. And that's uh, probably why I imagine uh, a lot of 
the work that you do now and who you interface with has kind of you're only really working with the people who understand this fully like your sync agents your one stops your music publishers and record labels who who know the intricacies and the nuances and legally what is what needs to be cleared and why yeah and and why i mean i'm assuming well i I guess the the question is, do you actually go direct to artists anymore or do you work with artists directly or have you kind of been burned too many times or just artists just don't realize uh, everything that goes into a song or needs to be cleared or they just conveniently forget about some of those bodies? (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, it goes back to the excitement of it. Like there's there's often, you know, I'll hear something. I'm, you know, a, a... rabid shazammer it's not Mm -hmm. unusual to see me standing in the middle of a supermarket with my like looking for the speaker (laughs) and i go stand under it and you know with my cart um (laughs) or to be in a bar and roll up and ask them what am i hearing you know things like that and so i'm always i mean i'm always open to and i find it very exciting to discover new music the problem is if somebody doesn't have licensing experience does not know how to license their music Mm -hmm. does not have somebody representing them for that Mm -hmm. um the unfortunate thing is i don't have the time to teach you sure yes and to walk you through it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's and that's the bummer of it yeah is that i you know i think all supervisors the excitement on our side of it Mm -hmm. is not only the discovery of new artists and new music, but I think, you know, more than anyone, there's a race to the finish line to be the first. Sure. (laughs) I love getting that email when they go, Oh my God, thank you. This is their first placement. I'm like, that's a win for me. That says that, you know, they have successfully got their song out there. I've heard it. No doubt. Other people want to hear it and discover Mm -hmm. it. That's a great feeling. Mm -hmm. You need to have the right people behind you. Good news is there's been a tremendous amount of books written, Mm -hmm. podcasts, Mm -hmm. panels given by organizations. There's a million different ways if someone is serious. And let me stress that. You need to be serious about your desire to step into having your music licensed. And you need to educate yourself about it. There's enough resources, more so than when I started 20 plus years ago. There's so many resources for people to go out and learn how to do this Mm -hmm. and and hence make my job easier. Hence make it more appealing to me to roll the dice on you if I know that there's someone in your camp that knows what they're doing. Because at the end of the day, this step in the process is legally binding. Mm. And if something goes wrong, the person whose name is on the paperwork is mine. Mm. I had a project I did two years ago and I cleared a song. I had assurances by pretty reliable people that they controlled the song. I licensed it. It got papered. Everyone got paid. It aired. Then I got an email saying, that song has my writer on it. Uh Uh-oh. And I had never done this in my career. I had to go back and tell the other folks, you need to give me some of that money back. (laughs) Send it back to, you need to write a check and send it to the studio. Yeah. We need to reconfigure your splits, taking into consideration this third writer that you didn't know about. (laughs) Right, wow. You need to tell any of your other publishers and writers that their their shares are going to be reduced. I mean, I had to go through all of this. Knock Wood, the person who came to me and said, my writer is on that song. I knew to be a legitimate source to be saying that to me and mm-hmm. thankfully knew and respected me enough to know that I would never do that on purpose, sure. that I had not been given the correct information. And I was able to rectify it without any legalities or whatever we just went back redid it got a bit of a refund (laughs) redirected the money but i mean it's frightening and it's a position that no supervisor wants to you know 
be a part of it. I mean, it, if you, if it, if not handled correctly and remedied correctly, that's a big black mark. Yeah. You become a yeah. risky hire. Sure. So speaking of which, the risky hire, and just <clears throat> step me through uh, what, because I see, I look at the, the, credits your credits and every other music supervisor that i'm looking into and their credits sometimes seem like endless and oftentimes overlapping uh where you're working multiple projects at one time and multiple shows and talk to me about just kind of the business relationship that music supervisors have who hires you uh what does that employment look like how long are these are they contracts is just step me through kind of how that works from the business side of being a music supervisor? Um, l- let me address your your statement about that UCS doing multiple jobs and they overlap. Yeah. yeah. Um, that is because being a music supervisor is not the most sustainable craft in career. Hmm. And the way we are treated, um, how we are paid forces us to carry multiple projects at once. Hmm. How, if, you how want, so? if you want to survive, yeah, you want to survive um, because you, you know, uh, a lot of projects are paid on a flat rate, but there is no actual ratio of workload attached to that. There is no actual beginning and end attached to that. Very often you're hired on a project and you have a conversation during the interview and you say, how long is this project? When is this film coming out? Or when does this show premiere? And you're given a window of time that you believe you're going to be working on the project and then it gets doubled. Oh, wow. So, And your fee doesn't get doubled then. Nope. No. Okay. Nope. You want to make a music supervisor cry? Tell them to take their rate and divide it up amongst the weeks they've been working on a project, and then you will see them cry. Oh and sometimes God. it adds up to less than minimum wage. I I saw uh, an Instagram post from Lindsay Wolfington. She posted a meme that said, "When you do the math and realize your hourly rate on a two-year project is three dollars and forty cents." <laughs> It's like, oh gosh, that's yeah, uh, and that's not a made-up number. That's not yeah. a made-up number. Mm. That's not a made-up number. And then you factor in that, um, unlike other people working in production, there is not a um, recognized payment schedule. It is based on, you know, oftentimes commencement and completion. So you're supposed to get half of your fee at the beginning when you start. In the the case of television, that would be when you receive your first script. So you know Mm -hmm. I was telling you, I I sometimes talk to people when they're developed, so I'm not getting paid for that. Oh, wow. But I'm expected to help develop it. So technically your commencement starts when you you receive a script Mm -hmm. and your completion is supposed to happen when you hand over the last of your paperwork, if that's what, you know, once the episode is mixed and everything else, it, there can be months between those payments. Wow. Sure. Depending on how somebody's post schedule is going. Huh. And you are vulnerable to having to stretch your dollar because you thought you were signing up for four weeks and now you're at the eight week mark and you're not getting, you haven't got your second half yet. Because something happened that delayed the mix. Hence, you have to take multiple jobs Mm. and Jenga them so that you can at least hope for the ability to count on money. But you can't really. You just don't know. You are at the mercy of the productions. There's nothing to protect you to get you paid. Because music supervisors are typically hired as independent contractors and just given checks and they're, you're not necessarily you're not employed by the studios as as w2 employees or anything like that we are never classified as an employee wow so you're not on that two-week pay schedule like everyone nope. else that's on the project nope we do not have any of the rights and privileges that the other employees have and yet 
every day that we are working, we are shoulder to shoulder with people that are. Talk about that. Um, what do you What do you mean by that? That you <laughs> the elephant a lot of, in the room. Yes, I mean, why? Well, you know, right? I've been following the unionization efforts of music supervisors, and I've been following along, and and I, you know, I've been on sets here and there, and and um, I've seen music supervisors on sets. I've seen editors and the directors, and and you know, there's a lot of people on set. So mm-hmm. <laughs> break break that down for me a little bit when you're saying that you're shoulder to shoulder with these people, but they uh, they have different benefits and working conditions than you do when you're essentially you know all working on the, for the same goal on the same project. The majority of the members of the crew belong to a union. Hmm. We do not. We are, we have formed one. The AMPTP won't recognize it at this time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, my favorite analogy, because a lot of people don't understand, you know, how much we collaborate with our coworkers. Yeah. How we are a part of the overall storytelling process sure that it's just shocking that we do not have the same rights and privileges that they do that Mm. we need a union in order to have we don't have health care we don't have pension and welfare and you better believe anybody who has to work multiple jobs at the same time Mm -hmm. do you think that people who have to work three and four jobs at a time can actually skim money off what they're making to set up their own pension and savings for retirement. We don't have those things. We also don't have the protection of safety within our workplace. If something Mm -hmm. goes wrong, we're not eligible to go to HR and say anything about it. We are completely Mm -hmm. on our own. Mm -hmm. So I tip my hat with the utmost respect, the analogy that I use, which people find really shocking when I talk about the need for supervisors to be recognized, to be an equal union member to the other people that work on set and in production alongside Mm us, is I often say to people, you know when you're on set and you go up to craft service and you ask for a banana and a bottle of water? And they go, yeah, I go, that guy's in the union. Wow, yeah. That guy's in the union, that girl's in the union. They're in the, they have, they, the person with the banana and the water has more protections than you. Wow. That seems mind boggling to me, mind boggling to me. Mm -hmm. When we are working so hard, we work crazy hours. There are no boundaries that stop somebody from calling us on a Saturday and making us start a music search. Mm. There is, you know, nothing that stops us, stops them from you know, making us put in a 17 hour day if if that's what it takes. Right, right. Mm. But if you make the person with the banana and the water work 17 hours, you better believe after a certain hour, they're getting overtime. Mm-hmm. We don't get overtime. Yeah. I work an average of six, seven days a week. Wow, oh my God. Because that's what it takes to do the work. Sure. Mm. So, you, I know that the efforts are to um, have music supervisors unionize, and I've seen that that around seventy five percent of like five hundred uh, listed music supervisors have actually signed cards saying that they would like to join a union. And the uh, IATSE union, which which represents a lot of entertainment mm-hmm. workers. Um, and a lot of your colleagues that you're shoulder to shoulder with, the IATSE union, um, has welcomed music supervisors into yeah. their union. So what's the problem? You mentioned something about the AMPTP, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, not recognizing those efforts. I don't quite understand. Uh, if if IATSE is welcoming you into the union, why aren't you, why aren't music supervisors now union members? 
you should ask the AMPTP that. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I was on their LinkedIn I mean, before this. I'm like, who are the people that I need to start emailing yeah, and asking yeah. them what's going on? Yeah, okay. Whose house can I camp outside? <laughs> right, um, right. Listen, I, there is, you know, it, it's a control issue. It's, mm. you know, they, there's, there's things that will come with that recognition that they don't appear to be prepared to do. Hmm. And, you know, why would, why would you agree to this when you could make us work 17 hours and not pay us overtime? Right. You know, there's, there's, you know, obviously recognizing and reclassifying us will have a, a, a financial bump for them because sure. now we're paying, you know, we would be paying into it pension and welfare, there would be payments made towards healthcare, all of those things. There would be those payments that allow us to get unemployment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. All of these things. And I'm, I'm sure at a bare minimum, they don't want to agree to the financial, you know, ripple effect that that would cause. But it, that doesn't matter. What matters is there's human beings working with no health care, mm -hmm. no no pension and welfare. Mm -hmm. No, no, no one's, yeah, no overtime, no safety no protocols. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Zero, so, zero protections. And the mm -hmm. only way that's going to change is through a union. And, mm. you know, I often say, music supervisors, we are a small and scrappy bunch. Mm -hmm. So nobody's taking their gas, their foot off the gas about this. Mm -hmm. And and the biggest lesson I learned, which is really sort of remarkable in this whole scenario about the refusal to recognize what's what's really shocking to me, a therapist once said to me, um, do not ever let anybody bemoan you for doing on your own behalf what they expect you to do for them. Mm. So when we are licensing and clearing music we are negotiating on their behalf and they expect mm -hmm. us to negotiate hard and they mm -hmm. expect us to negotiate with their with their best interests in mind mm -hmm. <coughs> well i'm going to turn the tables and now i'm going to do it for me yeah and that's what that's what 75 percent of the music supervisors are saying what what we do on your behalf, mm -hmm. we are now going to do for ourselves, mm -hmm. and we need this. Yes. And so we're going to fight for it. So where are the efforts at right now? Because I've been seeing this movement. I All the music supervisors that I follow, they've changed their Instagram profile pictures to this logo. Um, and there's a hashtag uh, going, the music supervisors equity, hashtag silent without us. Um, I've been seeing, you know, one of the instructors for Ari's Take Academy, who teaches our sync licensing course, Vo Williams, he wrote a really wonderful post about it. We um, love him. Yeah, he's incredible. Um, and he said, music supervisors changed my life. Uh, not only they vital bridge between music and picture, but they continue to elevate our work and my purpose. For a countless number of us, music supervisors have been fundamental in helping us fuel dreams, build wealth, and create security for ourselves and our families. Time to stand with our people. This movement's swelling. I mean, you've been getting press and NPR and Deadline and Billboard and Hollywood Reporter. So yep. what the people that are listening right now, there's like, this is crazy. Like music supervisors, they're a lifeblood of, of this industry and they've helped so many people. And I know so many people who are listening to this have worked directly with music supervisors. What can we do to help your efforts at this, this equity and fairness? <clears throat> Well, there's a lot you can do. Um, okay. At this point, we are focused on our social media campaign because we do understand that not everybody understands the craft of music supervision. Not everybody understands what we do on the daily basis, how much we collaborate with the rest of the crew. <laughs> we mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. work all together. Um, and so part of it is it, it's twofold. We are trying to educate people about what we do so that on the other half, they can support us when they see what we're doing and they see that we're doing it alongside a group of people who are protected and have all of these things that most people should have. Yeah. Um, 
we're asking that people amplify the message. If exactly what Vo did, if mm -hmm. you are an artist or a songwriter and you're collaborating, um, your collaboration with a supervisor and getting your songs placed has made a difference, amplify that story so that people yes. understand what we do. Um, there's a petition mm -hmm. that is available in the um, IG uh, account, Music I Needs Supervision. Today. Thank yeah, you. We'll, yes, we'll put that in the uh, the show notes. The uh, You have a great link tree tied to that. Um, yes, with all Instagram of the press account. that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll link and that. And thank you to people for, you know, thanks to the press for, you know, taking notice. There's a lot mm -hmm. of people who have supported the craft, um, especially amongst the entertainment, uh, you know, uh, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, all of those folks have always sort of championed us. Sure. Um, and I, I'm grateful that they're showing up now. But so check out the articles. You can learn more about what we do, how we do it. And then mm -hmm. we say amplify our message. At, at the bare minimum, retweet what you see. Sure. Repost what you see. And if you have it in you to do it and you've got some followers, tell your story mm. within your own social media platforms. If you know of anybody who has a strong presence and is important in the industry and mm -hmm. you think that they can help and would be willing to amplify our message. Like I would love to see some really big artists whose lives were, as Vo says, it can be life changing. I would love to see them post about this. Yes. You know, it can be a real turning point and we're down in the trenches trying to make this happen. We just want protections and, fair pay and what everybody else has to go with it. So mm -hmm. tweet, post, sign, talk to your coworkers. If you work in this industry, I, it's yeah. amazing the conversations I have had during a meal break on set. Mm. Just sitting with writers yeah, and talking to them about what is their setup and experience and how does it work in their corner of this production and then they ask me the same and they are so shocked by what they hear they had no idea they have no idea wow. so we really need everybody to understand that you know we we curate stories alongside our storytellers yeah and we change lives a little bit but most important we need good lives for ourselves. If yes. you work this hard, you should have this. Definitely. Right now, the scale is not where it's supposed to be. So mm -hmm. anything that anyone feels comfortable doing, and even if you're not, maybe push yourself out of your comfort zone a little because <laughs> this is, a really, yeah. this is yeah. a really good cause. And you know, just amplify the message, amplify the message. Mm -hmm. I want the AMPTP to hear us roar. Yes. Yes. And once again, that's the Music Needs Supervision Instagram account. Um, and those Silent hashtags. without us. Yeah. And there's Silent a Twitter. Mm -hmm. There's also that's, a Twitter handle. Yes. There's a TikTok. Everything. It's yeah. everything can be found on the Instagram feed. Um, mm -hmm. And anything else, you know, it's there. It's on, it's on Twitter. It's everywhere. Cool. And if you have a, and if you have a, if you know a supervisor, yeah, um, talk to them. They they can help mm. you figure out how best to um, support them. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it might just be an attaboy because we could use a couple right now, <laughs> just a little encouragement. Um, sure. You know we're fighting this fight, and our foot is to the gas. And yes, this we're not asking for something outrageous. That's the part, right. like. The message is everyone else has this. <laughs> like, how yeah. do you justify that we don't? Right, right. How can no. you justify that we don't, you know? Yeah. Fairness, yeah. safety and well-being. Mm -hmm. And we just want to be able to sit down at the table with the AMPTP and figure out and negotiate a deal that works for us. Yeah. And thank thankfully, we have IOTC. We have some representation. Right now, there has been so many years that supervisors have just 
you know, you're just out on an island. If something sure. goes wrong, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> good luck with that. Uh, well, I I'm seeing. Uh, I know you're you're so deep in the trenches, but. I've been seeing a, a major swell over the last couple of weeks, and and I feel like you're, this movement's reaching a tipping point. And I and I feel that in the next, hopefully in the next few weeks, uh, they're going to come to the table. I, it's you're right. I mean, you lay it out so clearly. There is no reasonable argument to withhold these benefits and withhold uh, this status when. All of your colleagues have it and virtually everyone else working on set and working on the same project that you're working on have these protections and uh, pay equity and all of that and and you don't. So um, it's very clear uh, to me and I think anyone else who's paying attention to this and fortunately the message is being more amplified and I encourage everyone who's listening right now to amplify it. Um, and you know we've made uh, posts and we'll continue to to amplify Thank on our you. end. But uh, of course, and and I mean, you know, like I said at the start, like my life has been changed, and and all of our our community's lives have been changed by music supervisors. Like we know the power, we know the importance of music supervisors in our industry, and you're like this wonderful bridge between musicians and the music industry and the film industry. And without you, we don't have that bridge. And and you know we've seen the power. Ah. Ads, Ads, film, yes, games, you name it, film, yep. TV, promos. It's yeah. if you are hearing music, even if you're hearing it in a store, there's right. people who are hired <laughs> to curate that yep. playlist for that store. If yes. you are hearing music, mm -hmm. somebody like us had a hand in it. Yes, you know, definitely. and the, the hardest, most heartbreaking, and I get so emotional about this, the worst part about this is because our craft has become so unsustainable at times because we don't have these things. I have seen so many talented people enter the field and leave. Mm. I have seen people get burnt out by the grind that we are forced to sustain with, you know, there's no, there's nothing that says we deserve a certain meal break. No, mm. we can be made mm. to work all day, every mm. day. Um, and that's heartbreaking to me is that it's so unsustainable that these, you know, brilliant, young, music loving people who discover that there's a craft that they can put to use their love of music, it'll die without more protections and things in place because it is not sustainable. Like nobody should have to work three jobs. Do you know what a supervisor would give to be able to just be on one project <laughs> and one project alone and not yeah. wake up every day feeling like they got shot out of a cannon because they got three jobs on the go because oh, that's gosh. what they need because they don't know when they're going to get paid. So you mm -hmm. need to have all three jobs going and yeah. hopefully everything comes in on time when you have a rent or a mortgage payment, you know, looking at, you know, it was, I, you know, I've said this before, it was absolutely terrifying. And I think one of the times that people really realized how, what little protection we had was when the pandemic hit mm. and you know we because of our pay structure we technically were not eligible for unemployment we were not eligible for unemployment can you right. imagine that yeah i mean a they, lot of musicians fell into that that boat as well um because a lot of musicians were, were contractors and stuff like that and and but everyone who was a, a, an employee got those those um unemployment benefits yeah yeah thanks to the cares act it was done and right. you know because for many production shut down and there yeah. was no no source of income for many and as i said if you're working three jobs at a time the chances that you have a good nest egg are very mm -hmm. slim right um and it was just frightening to see that and to feel such a deep concern for our you know one another who was going to be okay who was not we were all mm -hmm. reaching out to each other mm -hmm. does anybody need anything like whatever we could do and thank goodness you know the cares act passed and we were able to get unemployment the the mm -hmm. the shocking 
shocking thing about it was for many people it was the first time they got a regular check oh gosh <laughs> right, right right yeah like yep. not very many people know what it feels like to get a check every two weeks i think yeah. it is um <laughs> People had to learn how to fill out those forms because it had never been available to them. Yeah. Right? right, right. Shocking. Yeah. And because there was a regular check, you could do the math. And for some, based on the time frame and the amount, the hourly wage was better than when they worked full time. Mm, and wow. to me, that's a bit obscene. Yeah. Talk to me about the pay. Um differences because I, I i remember uh hearing or reading something that you said about um you would kind of tracked uh mm -hmm. what you made you know in 2006 on a project versus what you made now um in you know t tell me about that yeah but, well i did a little i'm just a nerd for spreadsheets i love <laughs> a good excel sheet and yeah. it's really i just because of the way my brain is wired and also which applies to how I do my job. Sure. Um, you know, spreadsheets are a great way to organize and track, track your licensing, track your budgets, like everything that you have to do in your job. So sure. it is a tool. And um, somebody had asked me a question about, you know, what we were, what we got paid. And by the way, we all get paid something different, which is also a problem because mm -hmm. If you're, if everyone's doing the same amount of work, like how come you're getting less or yeah. yes, maybe you get more because you have more experience and it's a heavier lift, but that doesn't always, that doesn't really exist. We need mm -hmm. some sort of pay scale thing put into place. Sure. But somebody had asked me something about, you know, my rate. And so I've been doing this 20 plus years. And so I went through a whole folder I have of with the exception of when my computer got stolen, I have every deal memo I've signed probably since 2004, 2006. Wow. And so I plugged in my rate in 2006. And then I saw that I had this rate for a few years. And then for some reason, uh, the studio dropped it down a bit on a job. Oh. Then it went back to what it was in 2006. Mm -hmm. And I did the math, so in so 16 years, right, mm -hmm. the math? And I looked at the rate that the same studio was offering me in 2022, and it was about a four to $600 difference. And I just thought to myself, like, if I worked in a bank for 16 years, would my salary only have gone up that much? Right. Right. Wow. Any other job? It, it adds even... up to, it adds up. Here's the, here's, here's the number crunch for you. Sure. It adds up to, I think, less than a 2% raise, raise over, over those years. years. This is, I'm talking about a per episode, you know, mm -hmm. in television. It, it, it was less than 2%. Mm. which was kind of heartbreaking just like once i'd done it i was like oh that's really that i'm looking at it and it's there i'm not yeah. imagining i'm not guessing like yeah. my hard numbers were in front of me and it was just so mm. disheartening to know that like all these years like there hasn't been a support system in place sure. to ensure that what you're being paid meets the cost of living in some way, shape, or form, matches inflation. Like, right, right. Our right. rates have been held down. Mm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I, um, I'm a, I'm a perpetual optimist, and I see, the, <laughs> I, I see the the work and the movement that's happening right now, and I believe that things are going to be changing very soon for all music supervisors for the better. And but it is because of the work that you're doing and everyone else is doing, Thank and you. because of the visibility, and it's. It's about damn time. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, it's We're not like, going anywhere. FY, we're not going right. anywhere. <laughs> right. Okay? But I mean, you're very this is, necessary to this industry. This is, this, is, this is 10 years in the making and longer mm -hmm. if you look back at the people who've been supervising for 20 and 30 years. Sure. But this and this talk has been going on the whole time. So mm -hmm. the fact that we are actually at a place where it's out 
in the public. Everyone knows about it. There has been a formal ask. Um, we're a scrappy bunch. We're not going That's right. anywhere. That's we're right. not going anywhere. <laughs> I am well, in this. I am in this for the long haul. Yeah. Um, I refuse to let this craft be destroyed. Mm. I refuse to let it remain unsustainable, unrewarding, unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to be doing it forever, but mm -hmm. I would like to see some other people doing it. And sure. that's not going to be possible unless these changes get implemented. Mm -hmm. So absolutely get used to this space it is not going <laughs> anywhere i am love i am it. in this fight till the end I love and it. uh there's a there's a large group of people who are also you know putting mm -hmm. in the work and again anybody who can help spread the word amplify the message mm -hmm. talk to people if you think there's people out there who don't understand why this is happening and are just writing yeah. it off like meh it's a money grab or something dumb. It's not. It's about yeah. people's right to have a safe workplace, be paid fairly, yes, yes. have protections. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're all going to be living in tents when it's time to retire because we're not going to have anything. So yeah. we just want well, fairness. You know, we're putting in the work. Definitely. At the end of yep. the day, I just have to stress the craziest thing is everybody's putting in the work. Right. We're right. working for this. You're we're working. not asking for something we don't deserve we're putting in the work definitely people are profiting off it yes. you do great you put great music in a mm -hmm. film it has a successful soundtrack yeah 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 who do you attribute that to yeah well, Madonna, this has been so informative and helpful. And uh, I think, you know, I, I know everyone listening right now is revved up for the cause and ready to go and and to to join in the fight and make sure that you get the um, to get all the benefits and equity uh, across the board that you deserve. Um, I have one final in the recognition. recognition. Absolutely. Yes. And the respect. Um, I have one final question that I ask everyone who comes on the show, and that's, uh, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? What is the new music business? I thought I was just stuck in the old broken one. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> there is actually, listen, there is, a new, there is a new music business. I have to tell you, um, it, it, was, it's a bit of a, it was a bit of a game changer with mm -hmm. the introduction of all of the different streaming platforms and different ways that music can be discovered sure. and you know i think i think you can make it a lot easier these days because of that because mm -hmm. you do not require to be signed to a major right or even an indie to have a successful career as a musician, as an artist in this business mm -hmm. anymore. So mm -hmm. I'm sure it means a lot to the musicians that you're not all chasing the same shiny ball and thinking that's the only way this is going to work. I mm -hmm. love that there are a million different ponds for you guys to swim in to have and achieve success. And the ripple effect is the new music business means I have more to choose from, mm -hmm. sometimes less people to tangle with, to yeah. have it. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I'm just here to cheer on and support musicians. I'm so in admiration of the craft of creating music and my job lets me show that admiration and again, like, give you some gas money for your van when you're on yeah. tour. So yeah. <laughs> the greatest thing about that, um, is that there aren't as many gatekeepers and I love music and I will never turn down having a good juicy talk about music and what we're listening to with a musician and all of this new music business lets me get a lot closer to it yeah. and you know feeds my little nerdy part of like I don't just want to listen to a song I want to know why you wrote the song what was mm. behind the song where did you record the song and those things are available to me now. That is the good thing about the new music business. Yeah. Is I think well. we're all benefiting from it if you love music and you want more access. 
it's yes. provided a lot more access and it's mm. made it easier for me to find people and find songs and find music I like. Nice. I just need to learn how to go out and license it. Right. <laughs> that's the education. Just that's where, that's I, where we come just in. Just because I found yeah. you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm hopefully uh, educating uh, the, this generation and the next generation to make your job easier in the future moving forward. Madonna Wade Reed, thank you so much. This is great. Thank you, Ari. I, thanks for giving me a uh, time to chat with you and catch up. Today's episode was edited by Maxton Hunter, theme music by Brassroots District, and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.